Okay, so this is now being recorded. Um, welcome back to the panel that we put together, Ask an Autistic. My name is Jessica Likewise. I'm the founder and CEO of Hope Education Services. I've been working with kids with autism for 12 years. What I found is that I didn't know a lot about autistic adults. And when I got their perspective, I realized I needed to make some modifications to some of the things that I was doing in my practice. And I realized that if I was making some of those honest, well-intended mistakes, probably other people are as well. And I truly believe that as professionals, we, have, we can do a really good job in finding out how to help kids learn. We can help with behaviors. We can help to promote language. But what we can't do is explain what it feels like to be autistic and some of the internal struggles that people that have autism are going through. So I put together this panel every week. They're so amazing. This was supposed to be a one-time thing. When I asked them if they would do it once, they said yes. And now they just, um, everyone's loving it. And we've had a lot of great participants and um, it feel like I'm like now with family when I'm on this call. So I'm super excited to welcome them back today. So if anyone, I do have everyone muted who is not a panelist, but if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to unmute and to ask your questions at this time. And if you have a question that you want to ask, but you're not comfortable saying it out loud, you can also chat it in privately to me. So it'll default to everyone seeing it. So if you put it in the chat, you have to change it to just me, but that's an option if you don't, and I won't see your name, I'll just ask your question out loud. I did have a question that was sent in to me. And we'll start with that while everyone's thinking of the questions that they have and we're waiting for more people to join. And that question is, what um, really, this person is talking about, adults. so what supports are in place for autistic adults today? And what do you think we need to have more of? So this person um, was saying that they, they have a family member and they're diagnosed as autistic and they can keep a job down um, and they can, they, but they have a really hard time with everyday life skills. So if there's any advice that you can give them on making sure that they keep a, a, a routine, that they keep themselves you know, clean, they keep themselves fed, they keep themselves the house taken care of, and all the things that come with living on your own. This person's really struggling with that. So what are some things that you personally benefited from? I'm going to ask the panelists, what are the things that you've benefited from? And what's some of the advice that you can give um, to this individual? So Jesse, you're first on my screen, so I'm just going to welcome you back. And by now, I think everybody knows who you are. If you don't know who the panelists are, just go to the first two videos and watch them because um, they introduced themselves twice already, and we want to get into everyone's questions today. So Jesse, what, um, what advice would you give an autistic adult or the family member of an autistic adult to get them the support that they need to be more independent and able to take care of themselves in every day? Well, first of all, that individual should be commended for holding down a job that itself is a huge accomplishment and the family should always give that person compliments if the compliments and accolades are not coming from the family members then the individual has to has to look at themselves in the mirror and give to themselves what may not be coming from somebody else uh, it may be difficult to engage in self-care because it takes so much energy and time to hold things together in the workplace that when they come home, their energy reserves are depleted. My advice is to make a to-do list, but only put one little thing on the to-do list at a time. Instead of it saying, clean the bathroom, it says, clean the uh, soap scum and other crud off the uh, sink counter. And then uh, it can go on after that's crossed off, the new thing can be written, um, clean out the bathtub and then so forth and so on because we tend to take on too much at once and that can be a recipe toward doom. And I want to um, empathize with that individual and, and understand that it, it may be really hard in their personal life to maintain friendships and a romantic connection Therefore, it will help to have organized activities such as maybe um, a volunteer work, something to make them feel like a, pr a productive member of society where they're engaged in social interaction because I don't think that a place such as a bar is 
very conducive toward meeting new people if that individual wants to utilize their free time. And it's also uh, important, I believe, for them to understand that they're entitled to take a vacation here and there. They have personal days and even sick days, even if they're not really sick. I mean, I'm not saying they should lie about it, but there could be a day where just five bad things happen over the weekend and it's best for them to say, look, I'm not mentally prepared to come into work. I, I don't want to be a, a martyr. I do not want to uh, jeopardize my job because this is just too much. And uh, taking a sick day when it's not a real illness is a lot better than coming in, <laughs> coming in and possibly uh, ruining their job, as we all know. Yeah, and then that's great advice. I love that. And one of the things that I like to do too in, in the idea of like chunking things down, you know, it's like I, whenever I'm even writing out business goals, it can be very overwhelming. I'll write down micro goals, you know, so like my goal is eventually to get this Zoom filled out and to get everyone um, full to capacity and to get everyone's questions answered. But you have to start small, right? So it's like one thing at a time. And sometimes we intrinsically know that, but we forget that when we're teaching children or working with adults. So one of the things I also love to do is just using your iPhone, setting up notifications on your phone, because it comes up, like you can set it up so a one task comes up at a time, and the next task doesn't display until this one's actually finished. And that can be just instrumental, because if you see a list of 50 things, you can just shut down and be overwhelmed and not even want to start. I know I'm definitely like that. So I have like my big list of things to do, but I also then will like write down smaller lists. And I have like lists everywhere. Like I'm, I have these like notebooks or this is the one I'm currently working in. And it's just like, just these little micro goals that I have written down. And it's just instrumental for me. And that's how my brain works, right? And I'm not autistic, but we have to remember that sometimes the same supports we would give ourselves we don't think about using them when we're working with like, other children or adults, but sometimes we have to realize that it's not making up this big grand stuff. It's like, what are the things we would want to do and like try those first. So I think that's great advice, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And that, that's also good advice to, uh, as a therapist, you kind of tell them your own uh, shortcomings and what you're battling with at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And like making relatable, making it relatable. So one of the things that I found talking to autistic adults, and I'm just, just, I'm very transparent on here and maybe more vulnerable than I should be. But, you know, I didn't realize that really everyone just kind of had sort of their own set of challenges. I mean, and everybody does, but really it's just like not that much different than anybody else. And it sounds like, obvious and then it may but it's not right that we think that people are just completely different because they're autistic and, and they're not I mean no one is I and mean, everyone in that I really truly believe that like different not less but it's also really not as different as I thought so and I think that just being relatable and just understanding as a professional that hey listen they're probably everyone's probably going through the same thing and the same struggle it may manifest differently but it's not really as different as you would think. Does that make, does that make sense, Jesse? That's right. We're, uh, we all have a little bit of uh, Asperger's in all of us. Is, that's what you're saying, that uh, what's striking are the similarities as opposed to the differences that divide the neurotypical and uh, population who have, who have autism. Yeah, and you can see, like, I'm, I'm generally a very eloquent speaker, and I'm stumbling over my words because I'm almost ink you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to even say this, but prior to working and assembling, working with autistic adults, not only through this panel, but through the television show I, I have, Bridge the Gap, I would have thought there were more differences between me and autistic adult than there were similarities. But what I'm finding out is there's actually more similarities than differences. Um, and so, I, want to, I want to add one more thing uh, to this advice. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to identify who, this, who the individual you're working with happens to be and there's some people with autism who just need one day to binge on Netflix and uh, nostalgic uh, cartoons on YouTube for 24 hours and others if they have just one day like that 
then they'll uh, allow the demons to come back. And I'm of the latter category. I, I do well with free time as long as it's combined with some meaningful tasks because if I'm idle for a solid day, I'll think of, I won't think of my two books I've published or having been on the Dr. Phil show. Uh, I, I think of how I didn't, I never wrote my family during summer camp for a month and uh, how horrible that was for them. Or the fact that I never labeled every single photograph on the back since childhood. So things like that torment me during a day of idle time. Yeah, and everyone's different, right? So some people really need that. I actually need my days to turn things off. I'm, um, I love ultra running. So I'll run for like 100 miles at a time and I'll just have no phone. And I sometimes I won't even see people. I did a hike today. I saw no other people, but I saw lots of animals and I need that time. But everyone's different. Some people in isolation will shut down um, and some people do really well. So keeping in mind someone's personality is really important. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so Michelle, I saw you shaking your head yes in agreement when I was talking. Um, and so I'm gonna have you come on next and just give your set of advice for the person who asked this question. I, I truly believe that, first of all, it is great that they, that you have handled like a job. That's one big accomplishment. And I will say that from my own perspective that I remember when I got my first job, like it was just like, it was just a big moment like towards like with independence and everything, like showing that like, you know that you can do anything like everybody else. And it's just that like now with like the hygiene skills and with everything, like uh, I'm gonna first share, I'm actually gonna first share from a little bit of my experiences like as a paraprofessional, cause I actually, have worked with children with autism, like on hygiene skills too. So like having like, again, knowing the child and, and, and different levels and everything, but like using like visual supports and everything, like visual schedules, like really help with like, in terms of like hygiene, having a routine, even as an adult, it doesn't matter, child or adult, doesn't matter. It's just having that routine down and like, year through a visual schedule a checklist like just like jesse said you know um having that checklist down for me i for me now personally i have a planner that that way i know like what i'm what i'm doing and stuff like like sometimes like to keep myself healthy like i i work out and stuff i do so like i try to make sure i do that and like in the morning and stuff and then like just to keep yourself together and like you know it's really important to it really is important to take care of yourself and like uh, making sure that like just having that schedule and everything. Yeah, thank you. That's really good advice. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> so Aiden, um, I'm gonna ask you, so you are, you're young, you're the youngest I think of all of, of, all of us here. So you're probably just transitioning into adulthood. So I, you know, what are you going through? I mean, I know you started your business and you were doing amazing. Um, so I think you're just a an, an shining example of an incredible young man. I mean, autism or not autism, you're doing incredible things, but you're also just kind of transitioning into adulthood. So, you know, what are some of the things that, if you're willing to be that personal, what are some of the things you're finding challenging and what is working for you to help you be um, really like nailing it? Cause you're doing, an incredible job. I mean, I've, I'm so proud of you, especially in this economy to just have started a business and be excelling at it. That's just incredible. Thank you. Uh, that's very uh, nice for what you uh, just said. Uh, before I, I, I answer that, I do just have to say that, you know, we're talking a lot about kind of what are the inner machinations of what it's like living with um, autism. But I do just want to point out that um, I, I, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds here, but uh, we've really been having a lot of uh, protests within the uh, uh, coming weeks, and there's also been uh, questions regarding African Americans or people of color that ha ha have autism and sometimes are encountered in uh, racially motivated situations or anything. I think it's also important that we know that while it's great that we're also looking into kind of what it's like um, to be uh, autistic. I, I believe all the panelists here are Caucasian. I do think it's also valid to kind of look into possibly in our own time or something setting up 
uh, what it would be like to have autism um, as a person of color because there's added struggles to that. So there's, I think, a lot to uncover with that. So I just wanted to recognize the people that have uh, voice those concerns and also are standing in solidarity with uh, African Americans and people of color. Uh, to, you know, uh, to answer your question, Jess, my, I, I'll start off with kind of the personal uh, experiences to answer the question, and then I'll kind of go into what I've seen working so far into this profession. For me, I've never really had the issue. Um, like, like, like we said, there, there, uh, having ASD, there's a, a, a spectrum of it. So sometimes uh, some children may have it very uh, severely or others may have it mildly. Um, there are some issues that I've never personally had. The, one of them is hygiene. I've never had an issue with that. I've never had an issue with um, remembering certain date, dates or anything like that, executive functioning. But there are other issues that I have that are definitely things that impact my day-to-day -day being. Uh, socialization. It's very, very hard for me to um, make friends because I'm always finding myself in a situation where I'm the one that's always starting the group chats. I'm the one that's always texting. I'm the always one that reaching out and I never really get anywhere. Like I always get the runaround. I always get something in which I can't quite seal the deal and be the person that's invited to the get together. Now I'm not a party animal or social person all that much, but you know, I, I, I do enjoy having that, having some, type of companionship. And I think everybody does in a lot of ways. So having that challenge, I mean, it gets so exhausting feeling lonely and it gets really exhausting always. So I am big on social media. I have an Instagram. I post all my stuff about my, my, my firm, but I also have friends that, you know, I follow and I, it, it, it gets, it hurts. Honestly, it really hurts me when I see, it seems as though everybody's having this fun and everybody's having all of the, th this stuff, but I think that it's a mistake. I think that the image of where we want people to be is misconstrued. And what I mean by that is, is that we as a society, so a lot of people believe that a person is overall more valuable based on the amount of friends or the amount of uh, things that they have, how much money you have, how much, how many houses, how many friends, how many of everything, the more you have, the more you matter. And it's especially hard, in my case, it's hard to even make a, a friend, even to have one. And that's because I, I, I like to think that I'm a very nice person, but it's hard for me because I sometimes miss some of the cues or I miss some of the little inner workings that what makes um, a friendship stick around. You know, I'm very conscientious, I'm very thorough, I'm very nice, but I still can't quite seal the deal. I don't understand how to get to that next point of actually having a friend over or going to the park. I'm not completely um, incapable. I, I do have the ability to, you know, call somebody up, but it gets hard, it's painful. I don't want to hear the rejection. I don't want to hear the excuse that is possible. They possibly might have a doctor's appointment or something, but it's, I've heard so many times in my life where the excuse turns out to be false. So in order to shape the narrative, in other words, in order to try and in, in my case, the area that I really need work with, need uh, working on is social development, social skills, everything like that. In order to try to fix that, the strategy for me has been, um, I see a therapist. So therapy is a really great start. It does, I, I see a therapist due to, you know, past trauma and a lot of past um, unrelated issues, but my social skills definitely coincides with the topics that I talk with my therapist. And, uh, you know, having a therapist or even speaking to a parent, a guardian, somebody that, a brother or a sister, somebody that might not have autism, who is willing to listen and actually willing to go step by step and figure out what's going on and why the social skills seem to not be uh, there. And I'll just end on a, one final note. So that's, again, there's, I'm using the word, uh, I'm saying, talking about social skills only because that's my 
personal issue, you could substitute that with hygiene. You could substitute that with safety, with, um, with, with uh, temper tantrums. You could replace that with anything. That's kind of the gist of what I'm saying for me personally. But um, I'll end with uh, this. For, on a professional sense, one thing that is actually really huge, and I actually thought this was getting archaic. I thought that everybody would be moving on to Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, all of that big stuff. But Facebook is an amazing resource. I'm in like all of the uh, New Jersey uh, Facebook groups. They, people are giving away uh, strollers or they're asking advice. It's a place to vent and not feel judged for it. I've seen posts where moms say, I don't know what to do anymore, or they ask for help. Going on the Facebook group and joining those groups and trying to kind of process what it's like, even having a disability, I do it because I have a disability and I also do it as a professional. Whatever capacity you have, Joining groups that directly talks about those issues is something that's absolutely great. Another thing is, is, is that if you're an adult, let's say, so we have K through 12 uh, students and they're required to uh, get uh, said services if you have an IEP and all of that. But when you reach an adult, it, let's say you're above the age of 21 and your school, you're, you're no longer affiliated with your school. You can go to the D Department of uh, Disability, Developmental Disabilities. You can, there's a lot of ways with the insurance, depending on insurance you have, there's a lot of resources out there that are hidden and it shouldn't be hidden. We really need to publicize and make more information available so that everybody can get the resources. But there's a lot out there. I, my, I'd suggest the first step is to just join a fa any Facebook group and comment any questions and you can always, uh, private message me on Facebook. You can always uh, reach out on my website or give me a call and I'm always here. So I guess that would be my answer to the question. Yeah, and you know, I think the power of social media is really huge. And yeah. I think that the proof of that is look at this panel. This panel, I so I met Kevin through a mutual friend, um, but otherwise the other five panelists I've met all on, on social media. I met, I met everyone on Facebook. Right, and then look at what good has come from this. So I do want you to know, Aiden, that I consider you a friend, and I think all the panelists <laughs> consider you a friend. And so you have at least you have at least six friends here. So um, you know, I just wanted to. And, and, and that feels great to have that kind of weekly, and perhaps I want, and I want to get to the point where I can talk to you guys even more. That's something I need to work on on my end. But having that support is something that really brightens up my day. I don't smile that much, but here I am smiling. And that's the thing that these little powerful connections that can be made from just Facebook or just sending a message to somebody is something that can really be life changing. Yeah. And I, it, it can. And I know that I've also experienced, so when I was younger, I've experienced bullying and yeah. I carry that a lot through into adulthood. And even just when I'm having business interactions, one of the things I struggled with the most when I first started working was not working with children, but being able to have conversations with parents because I also was rejected a lot as a child. So I can relate to what it feels like and to assume people are rejecting you even when they're not is something that I face a lot. And it is, you know, in putting yourself out there and being in those social situations, you know, that's something that's really important and social media might be a great step, especially if, you know, like this person said that, okay, they're, they're being challenged with really being able to find fulfillment in anything other than a job, you know, starting out on social media, it can be really powerful, you know, and as a, as a caregiver, that person, maybe they didn't experience that rejection. So they don't relate to what the person was going through, but you know, rejection the fear of rejection is real and the pain, of being rejected is real. And when you experience it as a child, it does carry on to adulthood. And oftentimes you insert it to places where it's not even happening. And it's very painful and it's very hard to work through, but you know, you can work through it. And I think it's like a muscle. It's like, if you go to the gym, you know, you're, if you want to deadlift 400 pounds, okay, yes, most people can do that, even women, but you're not going to do it the first time, right? Maybe you're going to deadlift 50 pounds, 60 pounds, and work your way up, eventually, you'll get to that point. I think eventually all of us will be able to be in those social situations, even if we have experienced some kind of trauma in the past, but it is hard, you know, it's hard. And I can definitely relate to that because I go through that myself. 
So I, I hear you saying it. And, and I think it's important for me to even tell you that, that yes, that feels familiar. You know, you're not alone. Be validated. Yeah, it's real. The pain of that is real. And it's, and it's hard to go through. And I think that for people that didn't go through that, um, understanding that that pain is real, you know, it is. Yeah. So that's something that anyone who's a caregiver or a friend of um, an adult that had that trauma, whether they're autistic or not, um, I really needs to try to understand that, that that pain is real. So thank you so much. And thank you for being vulnerable and sharing. And I hope that other people were empowered, but I also hope that you received something from being able to share your story and knowing that you're not alone. So, yeah, you know, being able to just briefly kind of, you know, not go too much into the weeds with it, but just kind of being, you know, I think that that's, you know, what the power of this group so far has given me. We're on, I think, episode three or so, and I'm starting, I'm, I'm seeing myself opening up a little bit more. And that's, I think, the power of conversation and the power of feeling safe. That's the big thing I think a lot of people want is the fear of not being rejected, not being judged. If they say no or they can't hang out with you, they're not going to go all around and tell people about it. They want to feel safe. I want to feel safe and I don't want to feel as though I'm going to be judged. And I find myself opening up a little bit more because I have that feeling in this group. So that's, I think, I, I agree with that. I think that it's very powerful to feel validated and to feel safe. Yeah, I think this is really turning into a beautiful group. I'm really, I'm getting a lot more out of it than I, than I thought I would. You know, when I first did this, I was like, great, this is going to be a, a great way to grow my email list. And I never realized how much I would personally receive from this. So um, just, you know, like I said, full transparency. I want to be fully transparent so I can create that for everybody who's here. And all the parents and professionals who want to answer questions and ask questions that might be hard to ask as well. So that I think that we want to have that space for everyone. So thank you, Aiden, for sharing that. So Rachel, I'm going to have you share next with your advice is for um, an adult who's struggling with, like I said, they have the job, they have that down, but everything else seems to be really hard for them. So you might be in this world and you think you have everything, but there's just so many people who think they have autism and that's just not enough. They want to get rid of it, but there's no magic pill that's going to get rid of your autism. And there's nothing to be ashamed of if you have it. And I think that's the real epidemic. We need to stop being ashamed of what we were born with, what we were made to be. Because I think it's so many factors, the media's idea of perfection, other people telling us we need to look a certain way, we need to act a certain way, we need to have eye contact, this and that. It makes us ashamed of being who we really are. So we need to take things back. We need to be happy with how we were wonderfully made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so hard and it's exhausting to try to pretend that you're somebody you're not. And I think that that's something that everyone can relate to, whether they're autistic or not. I know I, like I said, I relate to that. But it's different when it feels like the entire world is set up to reject who you are. You know, so, you know, I experience it on some level, but I can imagine that someone who's autistic experiences it on a much greater level because the world is set up for people that are neurotypical. And it's like, like someone who's in a wheelchair, right? The world is not set up for them. And it's like simple things, and I never even thought of this, but I was watching a television show and it was about, um, I, was, it was, I was watching, I think it was like Queer Eye show, whatever um, the new show is where they come and transform people's lives. And one of the episodes, someone was in a wheelchair and one something I would have never thought about is he said he really loves to cook, but he's limited with what he can cook because most of the spices are on a top shelf he can't reach. So he doesn't have the option to use like different spices that he would want to be able to use in his cooking. And I never really thought about that. And it's just like a really like concise example of how 
the entire world is set up for somebody who is born without a quote unquote disability. But really, we as a world, it's easier for us to accommodate uh, and to change aspects of the way the world is set up than to ask someone to change to fit into the world. It's not fair. You know, there, and there's things that can be done um, to help people. And it, and it really just starts off with acceptance and understanding. I think that's really the most important thing is that we can't expect someone to be somebody they're not for us. It comes at too high of a cost. And I think that's really important to remember that this, the cost is way too high for someone's social, um, their self-esteem, for their morals, and just for their personal identity. And it's not fair. Um, it's not fair to ask us to, for ask us as uh, as a society to everyone to change to accommodate to make us happy. It's you know, it starts off with just loving and accepting people, like you said, Rachel, for the amazing person that they were created to be. And I don't believe God makes mistakes, so I think everyone was created exactly how they're supposed to be. So that's beautiful. Thank you. So Kevin. Um, would you like to share a little bit about this? Um, and I know that, you know, you are do also doing exceptionally well and you're working and also trying to figure out navigating like life independently. So if you're willing to share some of what's been hard for you and, and what's worked for you and ha what's helped you to get to where you are now, that would be really helpful for our audience. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so yeah, well, like, this guy, I, I do have been successful in holding down a full-time job and really, and, and I've been generally working, working steadily full-time for the past, you know, seven, eight years and in the same fit. And so I've, and I've, and in two different types of job, two different jobs of pretty much the same thing. So, so I've been successful of both adopting to every job I've gotten into and holding down a, a full-time job. Now, having said that, uh, there one, thing I will note about the jobs I'm holding or I while I'm while I am it's good to have a job I also have generally felt underemployed because there I've been working in a job that requires um, a high school diploma when when I'm you know have a college when I actually do have a college degree in special education so <laughs> and really this so the struggles I've really found is when I found out being a special education teacher wasn't going to work for me, figuring out what was going to be, you know, my next, you know, suitable career um, and in kind of finding my way after that. And, and really self have been struggling to do that a little bit and, you know, kind of, and have sort of gotten stuck in working in the, a dead end job, you know, that's while it's good to have a job, like I said, again, it's um, uh, also, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, it's a dead end job, like low paying dead end job where I'm not really, you know, advancing, you know, <laughs> with my careers in life. So I've struggled with in that, you know, <laughs> way. And yeah, I identify with while I have a full time job, also struggling to keep up with the <laughs> demands outside of work, you know, and as far as what I would advise, um, uh, probably, um, you know, keep I think I personally, and I think a lot of people on the spectrum work <laughs> well when there's a with a routine. So kind of establishing a routine and a schedule and a, that you follow consistently, I think is one thing that uh, I try to do with certain things and has helped me in some areas. And, um, and yeah, like I like what Jesse, I identify one thing Jesse said is uh, some why it's can be why it's an accomplishment even for us sometimes to hold down a job is um, like to the, the work day can be like, well, while it's stressful for everyone, it can be extra stressful for us because we're in addition to like navigating, you know, the the, the stress of of the job of whatever, whatever challenges the job puts on us itself or also 
juggling the social interactions on the job more like trying to trying to really navigate the you know show you know the fitting you know both are fitting in with you know neurotypical with most neurotypical co-workers who don't who we don't like quite fully understand their world like just like they don't and they don't fully understand us so that's one thing that i think could make it you know doubly you know stressful and therefore we like what while you know everyone needs downtime i think there you can make a case that we are, are a population that especially needs our downtime or our time to really you know de decompress and like and you know really and in you know de-stress ourselves you know after a after a like a stressful work day or stressful work week you know like so yeah i i, I relate to what Jesse was talking about earlier with that. Yeah, one of the things I often tell parents is that, you know, the idea of working 40 hours a week, it's very arbitrary, right? And this idea that, and I, and I um, you know, and Rachel brought this up too, is that like people shouldn't be judged by what they have. Or Aiden brought that up, I apologize. I was trying to remember who said that, because it was an amazing thing that people shouldn't be judged by what they have or what they do. Right. So if somebody, maybe they're just basically juggling too many balls. And if someone say, if someone's working 40 hours a week, but they're having a really hard time with social interactions, they're having a really hard time with like hygiene, they're having a hard time with figuring out independent living skills. Maybe that 40 hours a week is just too much. And we're putting an expectation for them to do something that they're really not able to do. It may look like they're able to do it because they are doing it, but at what cost? Like what is being sacrificed, right? So it's like sometimes if all those other things, and maybe they're all their, you're expending all their energy and all of their kind of like, there's only so many balls you can juggle. Maybe to, for me, having a job is one ball, but maybe that's five balls for somebody else, right? And so for me, I can juggle the one ball of work and the one ball of socialization and the one ball of taking care of my house and the one ball of taking care of my body. And that's four balls and I'm juggling them. And I think I do a pretty good job of it. But what if, what if the person who maybe like is, is working 40 hours for me, that might be one ball, that might be six balls for them. And they might drop them all and maybe, or maybe they're doing it, but there's nothing else. There's no room left for anything else. So sometimes I tell parents is like, look, I know you want, you are you want this person to be able to work and provide for themselves and oftentimes the incentive is actually financial right you want someone to you don't want to have to pay for someone and that happens a lot with caregivers you don't want to be financially responsible for someone especially when it's a sibling and it's not a, a child um but in the same sense it could be that if something has to give maybe reducing work hours is is a good first step you know, I've definitely spoken to friends of mine even that have children and they're um, young adults that are they're autistic and they're like, well, I really, really want my daughter to work 40 hours a week because that's what I did and that's what my other kids did. And I'm like, well, great, but your daughter's different than you. She's different than your other kids. And, you know, if that takes too much out of her, it might be asking too much of her. So I think that's really um, important, Kevin. Thank you for bringing that up. And sharing yeah that. and i do think it's yeah important to note that a lot of us really aren't good at juggling as much as the modern especially the modern you know neurotypical world demands us to be and and i think that's lar and i think it's largely cultural cult culturally where where we live in a really fast-paced you know 21st century world that really expects people to be good multitaskers and juggle jugglers like you say and but you know that's one thing that i'd say i won't I don't want to speak for everyone on the who's on the spectrum, but I think what I, I identify with, and you know, when I and I from what from a lot of peers, you know, that, that I know on the spectrum, I think would agree that it's that that's not something that comes as easily to us. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and that's okay, right? And it's okay. I think it's for important for caregivers and parents to realize it's okay. And important for caregivers and parents and professionals to place an appropriate level of expectation on somebody, you know, and not put the expectation that society says 
a person should be capable of, but actually really assessing what is healthy for that individual. And understanding that being a, and quote unquote, productive member of society, which is usually what parents refer to as like their goal for their, their child when they grow up, that that looks different for everybody. So that's right. And yeah, maybe I'll just add on there. Maybe the, the, it can be argued then that we might need a little bit of, you know, or at least education too on to be, to, to, you know, like, um, you know, not to not succumb to the pressure of society. Cause I'll say like, I personally like do want to, you know, really try my best to, you know, really, really do want to be more like, you know, the quote unquote normal, you know, <laughs> living the quote unquote normal lifestyle. So I'm, I'm really like in favor of having a 40 hour work week and, you know, and, you know, being a cat and being like, you know, financially, you know, self reliant and all that. That's all stuff I that's all stuff I do personally want for myself and strive for, but um uh, and and tend to feel um uh and tend to and tend to yes, probably let let it affect my self esteem if I'm not able to achieve that or achieve what, you know, what I feel like most neurotypicals should. So maybe yeah, we do need some education on not letting that, you know, get to us affect our self esteem, you know. Yeah, I think like one of the sayings, I, I don't know who said it, but I remember a history teacher saying it when I was in, in very young. I mean, I was in, in elementary school and she said, you know, some people start off on third base and think they hit a triple. And, you know, some of us, some people are born with incredible athletic talent, athletic talents. Some people are born with like incredibly artistic. I mean, my brother, he's very artistic. He can draw and paint and he's an architect now and he's very talented. Um, one of the things I have in common with the two-year-olds I work with is my art skills. It is, they have never progressed past the age of two. And I can guarantee you when I do an art project with, and when I'm working with early intervention kids, that if you held both of them up, they're indistinguishable of my art and their art. So Monica's laughing. Um, Monica probably knows me well enough to know that's actually true too. So yeah, she's shaking her head. Yeah. So everyone has their talents and their skills. And you know, for me, um, I'm very comfortable speaking in front of people. Um, I have a friend and, and I, I build websites and she suggests, you know, build my website. I'm very creative, but I'm not techie. Okay. I'm like, okay, I got that. And that's what makes the world beautiful is that everybody has different skills and um, the world would not be beautiful if I was painting art. It wouldn't like buildings would fall down if I was in charge of architecture. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because I have my skills and talents and I use them in a way that's meaningful and productive to me. And I, um, pay somebody to do, write, do the pictures on the painting my, my walls. If I painted my wall, when I paint in my house, there is typically significantly more paint on me in the floor than I get on the wall. So I just know, okay, I have to pay someone to do it and that's perfectly okay. I do um, other things. So Monica, if you can share with us your perspective on this, I see you laughing. Um, what okay. advice would you give to this family? And I know Monica, so Monica is actually living this because she's helping teenagers now um, to, who are struggling with very much some of these skills. So Monica is very, um, very well equipped to handle this question. So I've heard some of the answers, but sorry, I did show up late. So can you just tell me the parent question? One more time, sorry. Got you. So the question actually came from a caregiver who I believe is a sibling. And they were saying that the person is really, is their, their sibling who's autistic um, is really struggling with everyday skills, life skills, with personal hygiene, with being able to remember to eat, with really just being able to keep the house clean enough that they can live independently. But they work and like financially they're doing fine and they can hold a job down. So the expectation patient this person has as well financially they should be able to live alone why are they struggling with something that seems like to them as basic like brushing your teeth like they think if they can work 40 hours a week and, and make money they should be able to do that like what's going on so that's the perspective that I think that the caregiver just doesn't understand um, what's what's even happening and since they don't understand what's happening they don't know how to help right okay so my immediate assumption is that the 40 hours a week is taking all this person's energy. 
so they don't have the capacity to do anything beyond it. So, and that's um, what Kevin was saying about you, you can do these things, but then, or maybe it was you, I'm not sure. Sorry, guys. Someone was talking about oftentimes you can engage in those 40 hours, but then you have nothing left for the other things. I feel like that's probably what's happening here. Um, I personally, there's no way I could work 40 hours at like a typical job of like sitting at a desk or doing fast food or something like that. I would never, I, I, there's no way I, ha I have the capacity for that. I can work 90 hours working in what I'm, what I do working with kids who have traumatic histories and moving through healthier ways of coping. I can, I can do that for 90 hours some weeks, but I couldn't, I couldn't be like a banker for 40 hours. I, I don't have the capacity for that. So, um, I think that, that you're right, that there is a lot of societal pressure to maintain the cultural expectation of 40 hours. Do I want to be financially independent? 100%. But my way of dealing with that is to keep my cost of living super low. So like I, I buy stuff in bulk and I coupon and I don't eat out and I just keep my cost of living super low so that I don't have to work much in order to be financially independent because I, I couldn't do 40 hours a week of something monotonous or that I didn't feel super invested and passionate about, which is part of the ADHD in me that I only really do things that I love. Um, but that's my, that's my first guess is if, the, if they're maintaining the job and not maintaining anything else, then the, the priority of the job needs to come down. So maybe even if they drop to 35 hours a week, that's an extra hour every day that they have to recover from the work day and then they could move into some of the household tasks or it's an hour in the morning that they have time to transition into the work day, that they have time to mentally prepare for those hygiene activities and things like that. Like it's 35 to 40 hours doesn't seem like a huge thing, but when you break it down to that's an extra hour every single work day, that is a big difference. Um, so, eh, okay, I'm lost again. Can you retell me the question? <laughs> no worries. So yeah, the question is just how to help support someone with the everyday living skills when they're really struggling with that, even though they're financially independent. So some, like, some easy little supports would be to come up with a schedule together. You could plan it with them or just suggest to them, challenge them to try to do it, depending on their motivation level or skill set or if that would be overwhelming sit down and just do it you know it could be like what do you what do you want to accomplish on tuesday morning and what do you want to accomplish on thursday afternoon like it doesn't have to be super complicated but sometimes just having that written out or as a visual um can support somebody being successful checking things off can support like motivating you to do stuff um, you can put different schedules in different areas of the home that like there's a bathroom schedule of don't forget to put, brush your teeth and put on deodorant. And then there's a kitchen schedule of don't forget to rinse your dishes after breakfast. So those little reminders can go a long way for someone who is drained from doing the 40 hour a week life. Because we're not designed for that. No one is. Neurotypical or not. I think that the autistic community just does a better job of being real about how much it sucks. <laughs> so, that's my suggestion. <laughs> yeah, I, it is hard sometimes. I, I agree. Sometimes we all take on too much. And that was my first thought as well. So I'm glad that I am in, um, I'm in good company there. So thank you. And that's the advice that I, I actually gave this person when I spoke to them. But I think this is going to be really helpful for them. So I'm glad that we were able to, and they were not able to get on tonight, but I know they'll really appreciate everybody answering their questions. So thank you, Monica. Now we have um, probably not time for 
everybody to answer another question, but is there any questions that anyone has for any of the panelists, um, any of the, anyone who's on the call that would like to just ask um, a quick question to one or a quick question to, for any of the panelists to answer? Okay. Well, if not, then um, we'll end a few minutes early tonight. I want to thank everyone for doing this. I think this is amazing. Um, these conversations are so helpful and they're so needed because the more we have them, I think the better understanding there will be about autism. And I think that the more um, integrated and, and accepting and loving the community will be. And like myself, professionals and neurotypical people will realize that there's a lot more um, the same about everyone than there is different. And I think looking at the struggles going on in this world, um, and I, I think I was frozen, so I don't know if you, were you guys able to hear what I was saying? I couldn't hear yeah. Oh yeah, you're frozen. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I was saying we'll wrap up a few minutes early tonight, so I apologize about the tech difficulties, but it's all good. What are we going to do? Um, and I was just saying, you know, that the more we have these conversations, I think the better off that the world will be. And one of the things I think that's most problematic with society today is we look outside and we, we see people as more different than the same. And whether or not we're talking about race, or we're talking about age or gender or, or neurodiversity, what makes us the same and what makes us human is a lot stronger than the small things that make us different. And I think that this is gonna really help to see the humanity in people and the fact that all of us are really on a different level, but really thinking about and struggling with and, and the same things every day. And I think that's gonna lead to a much better world of understanding and love and acceptance. And so I'm just really grateful um, to the, for the part I get to play. And I'm really grateful for everybody who shows up every week and for the panelists. And, and if you watch this on YouTube, um, a lot more people watch this on YouTube than show up live. I'm grateful for you guys too, because really you're gonna help us make the difference so, you know, if you liked this, share the link. We're gonna be doing this every week. Um, there will be one link now. So now there's not gonna be a different link every week. So now the link that you have will now work for every Tuesday. And um, share it, get your friends on it, get your coworkers on it, share the recordings because the world needs to hear this message. So thank you guys so much. And I look forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday.